This is Matthew Cratter from Trade University, and today I want to talk about whether Japan, in particular the Bank of Japan, is about to tank the U.S. stock market. As part of this, we're going to talk about its possible impact on U.S. housing as well, as well as an interesting insight this gives us into why Bitcoin might become the new global monetary standard. So make sure you stay tuned for the whole video. So the Bank of Japan, which is the central bank, in Japan, as you might imagine, has been struggling with what's called yield curve control. You might also hear that called YCC or abbreviated YCC. And what this is, is you basically put a cap on interest rates, you put a cap on yields by buying government bonds. Because this takes advantage of the mathematical fact that when the price of a bond goes up, its yield or interest rate goes down. So what the Bank of Japan does is they just print a bunch of new Japanese yen, JPY, and they use it to buy what are called JGBs. There's a lot of jargon here. JGBs just stands for Japanese government bonds. And so this is what they've been doing. This is what they did all of 2020, all of 2022. They kept yields capped on the 10-year government bond at 0.25%. Again, that's not 25%. We're talking a quarter of a percentage point. So yields are capped very, very low in Japan, while the rest of the world has been moving to much higher interest rates in part and mostly driven by the U.S. Fed raising interest rates. So this cap on interest rates worked fairly well in 2022. There was a little volatility at the beginning of the summer and interest rates briefly spiked up above 0.3%, above 30 basis points. But again, the Bank of Japan, the central bank came in, bought bonds and drove interest rates back below 25 basis points. So this is the level that they were defending. You may hear it expressed in those terms. Now, as we said, this is not an easy thing to, to maintain when almost every other country is raising interest rates. The, the Eurozone, the ECB, European Central Bank was raising interest rates. The Fed was raising interest rates, as was Canada, Australia, etc. And this is why the Bank of Japan eventually lost control late in 2022. And we haven't spoken about this yet, but this happened right before Christmas. The Bank of Japan let, let this be benchmark rate rise. So they said now, instead of the, the cap being at 0.25%, it's going to be at 0.5%. So they basically gave up defending that level because they weren't able to. And we can see what happened when, when this was announced on December 20th. Yields in, in, instantly spiked from 25 basis points to above 50 basis points. And you can see now that we're trading right around that interest rate cap of 50 basis points. And so what's what you have is when a market tries to put a cap on something or a peg, I, I'm sorry, when a central bank tries to put a, a cap or peg on something, free market forces will try to force them uh, to, to give up on that peg or that cap and try to basically uh, call their bluff as you might do in poker or something like that. And so this is where we are now. And the shocking thing about this, as Robin Brooks uh, talks about in this tweet, he says, oh my God, BOJ lifted the ceiling for 10-year JGB yield from 0.25 to 0.5, as we just spoke about. And here's the result. It had to buy 16.2 trillion yen in JGBs and Japanese government bonds to defend the new cap. Exiting any peg, in this case, a yield cap is extremely costly, as we were saying, a warning for any yield cap proponents. And this is definitely something that the Fed is going to need to pay attention to. For those of you who don't use your use yen as your unit of account, this was a, a quite a large amount of money. It was $122 billion that they needed to do, they, that the Bank of Japan needed to use to defend the level 0.5% uh, and keep interest rates below that after they moved after they move the cap. So the Bank of Japan clearly has a problem because if they don't put a cap on yields, it could bankrupt the Japanese government through higher borrowing costs. Japan has the highest debt load. The Japanese government has the highest debt load of any, any developed economy in the world, I believe. And so there's this financing cost. How do you pay for the government and how do you pay for financing the government's debt? So the way they've been doing it is the Bank of Japan, as we said, they've just been printing yen, buying JGBs, and keeping yields low in this in this way. And where do they buy the JGBs from? They buy them on the open market, but they also buy them from, it's essentially buying it from the Japanese government. So you have the central bank monetizing deficit spending that is being done by the Japanese government. And the problem with this is if you keep printing yen 
as the Bank of Japan has been doing, it destroys your currency versus other currencies if they aren't doing the same. And this is why we saw the huge appreciation of the US dollar against the yen. So when this chart goes up, the US dollar is getting stronger, the yen is getting weaker. And when the chart goes down, we've seen some a bit of a reversal the second half of uh, 2022 and going into 2023. This is when the yen, uh, when this moves down, the yen is strengthening against the dollar. But we can see that the yen, even though it's appreciated, has, has lost a lot of money. Um, it has depreciated against the dollar. Uh, that's the big picture with the US dollar, Japanese yen interest rate moving from about 105 now to about 132. So this is a, a direct result of the Bank of Japan printing up too much yen in order to defend that yield curve level. So what if there are another way for the Bank of Japan to get its hands on a lot of JPY, a lot of yen, without having to print it? Before I talk about that, I just ask you if you're enjoying this video so far, finding it helpful, that you hit that like button, hit the subscribe button, that's the most important thing to do, and maybe leave a question or comment below. That would really help out the channel. So what is another plan that the Bank of Japan could follow? Well, if we take a look at the largest foreign holders of U.S. Treasuries, which are U.S. government bonds, we can see that Japan and China are at the top, and they have been for a very long period of time because they recycle their trade surpluses into U.S. government bonds. Now, they have been selling off these bonds. So, for example, back in October of 2021, Japan owned approximately $1.3 trillion dollars worth of US government bonds. Now they're down to closer to a trillion. Japan, uh, I'm sorry, China owned a, a little over a trillion back in October of 2021. And then they now own, uh, these are delayed uh, data, obviously. As I'm recording this, it's uh, uh, January of 2023, but these are, this is as of October, 2022. China's back down below a trillion. So they've been selling off their treasuries as it is. But this is something, this is sort of a weapon that Japan has at this point because they've been, they've been exporting more than they've been importing. And as a result, they've had a trade surplus. They've been able to accumulate all of these, what you might see as, as country savings. And uh, basically we've given them, given them this paper, but it is still an asset that they can use. So how can Japan use its huge holdings of US treasuries? This is what they could do. The Bank of Japan could sell off some of these treasuries for US dollars, for US dollars cash. Take that US dollars cash and sell it for yen, and then take that yen and buy JGBs with it. So what does this mean? This means that US treasuries would sell off. This means that the US dollar would sell off because it's being on the margins. If there were no other things happening, US dollar would, would sell off because it's being sold. Um, it's being sold and Japanese yen are being bought. So the Japanese yen would uh, strengthen and Japanese government bonds, price would go up, yields would go down. So now basically what you would have is you would have the same effect. You would have the central bank in Japan, the Bank of Japan would have a huge bucket of yen that they could use to buy JGBs, thus keeping interest rates pegged at a very low level and continuing their yield curve control. This would allow the Japanese government to continue to issue more debt and engage in huge budget deficit. So this is how you monetize government deficit spending without printing more Japanese yen. So you don't run into a problem like this where your currency depreciates sharply against the US dollar. So this is something they can do. And people have been talking about this for a very long period of time. It's, it hasn't really happened over the last 20 years, but we may be seeing the beginnings of a new era here. And we can already see just looking at the last year or so of data that Japan and China have been selling down their treasuries. This is one reason interest rates have been moving up in the US, especially the 10 year uh, US treasury rate. And it's also been moving up because the Fed itself is selling a small amount of their treasuries. They're trying to shrink their balance sheet. So you have the situation where all these central banks, including the Fed itself, want to dump US treasuries. And this is where problems can come in. So now I'm going to turn to Harold Malmgren, who's a Washington DC insider who's been around since the days of Kennedy, Johnson. I believe he's in his 90s now. He was also active under Nixon and Ford. So he's a very, very connected guy in terms of uh, politics and the global economy, the global financial system. So this is Harold Malmgren tweeting on January 6, 2023. A new BOJ governor, new Bank of Japan central bank governor on April 1st, which is when he's going to be appointed, the new one's going to be appointed, might shock global bonds. My intel arguably the most influential former governor, Fukui, 
whom I've known since Greenspan and Trichet days, strongly promoting Yamaguchi, who is a Kuroda critic and openly hawkish, possible BOJ shockwave coming. So we're going to talk about what this means. He's talking about that Yamaguchi is emerging as the, the top candidate to be the head of the Japanese Central Bank, the Bank of Japan, and that he uh, is someone who would consider this sort of option. So why is this a problem for U.S. stocks? We've already alluded to it. Bank of Japan selling U.S. treasuries, obviously bad for treasury prices, drives up interest rates. Those higher interest rates drive up mortgage rates. The higher mortgage rates go, the more difficult it becomes to finance a house in the U.S. So this is obviously bad for U.S. housing, bad for U.S. real estate. It's really bad for every asset class in the U.S. When interest rates move higher, asset prices usually move lower. Those higher U.S. interest rates also increase the discount rate applied to stocks. Higher discount rate means lower stock prices in everyone's stock pricing models. It's also common sense if you think about it. If you, if interest rates in the U.S. have short-term interest rates and savings rates are about 0%, it might make sense to buy some McDonald's stock or Coke stock or buy a corporate bond in order to clip some coupons or get a dividend payment. And so it might make sense to buy Coke at, with a 3% dividend yield as it's traded at for the past five years or so until recently. And so people will do that. They'll buy stocks when they can't get any yields on their U.S. treasuries or their U.S. US banking accounts. But if you can, if you can uh, receive a 4 or 5% T-bill or U.S. Treasury yield, on the margins, you might not want to hold as many U.S. stocks, especially when the stock market has become so volatile. So this is another way in which when the discount rate, when interest rates go up, stock prices go down because people go to the, the relative safety of U.S. Treasuries. Now, of course, the U.S. will continue to devalue the dollar, and so this isn't the best place to be long-term, but it might make sense over the short term. Now, Harold Malmgren received a lot of criticism from this, a lot of very snarky criticism, basically a uh, fellow investor, philo investor here saying, so what's this new BOJ governor going to do exactly? And Malmgren really confirms where he's coming from in tweeting this. My tweets are thoughts of my own or specially sourced info that I think may be of benefit to followers. In this is instance, based on 60 plus years interaction at the highest levels of Japan finance and politics, I would have to be a mind reader to answer your snarky question, but alas, am not. So I think this is the context we have to take this tweet, that there's a very good chance, and it seems that other media outlets like Reuters are speculating there's a very good chance that Yamaguchi is going to come in and possibly shake things up. This would just be a continuation of the trend, as we've said that we've already been seeing, of Japan lightening up on their U.S. Treasury holdings. Big picture here, though, it's important to keep an eye on the big picture, is that both U.S. friends and enemies are dumping their treasuries. So we had Russia get out of most of its U.S. debt, U.S. Treasury, treasuries back in 2018. This might have been a warning signal of what was to come in terms of the war in Ukraine, etc. And it's important to note that they were selling treasuries and they've been buying gold with that. In spite of this, it's been pretty pathetic how little gold has really reacted to foreign central bank buying. We've had, as we said, China pairing back their holdings of U.S. treasuries, and uh, as we alluded alluded to here. So the big picture, both U.S. friends like Japan and companies, countries that are more considered enemies like Russia and China are dumping and diversifying away from their U.S. government debt, their U.S. treasuries. Now, this is what it looks like when the world is moving to a new monetary standard. I think this may be finally happening, accelerated by trade imbalances and huge debt levels, also accelerated by the pandemic and the aftermath of that. Now, U.S. Treasuries have been a global reserve asset since 1971, and really even before, all, all the way back to, to Bretton Woods and the agreements that were made to create a new monetary system, namely the U.S. dollar system, in the wake of World War II at Bretton Woods. U.S. Treasuries have been this global reserve asset. Going forward, look to see a lot more global trade settled in gold. We're already seeing this a little bit with Russia and China and possibly China and Saudi Arabia as well. There's also been a lot of talk about the rise of money backed, uh, of a new money uh, or a new currency that's backed by a basket of commodities. So maybe you say that one uh, bank, bank core is backed by a certain number of, of bushels of wheat, a certain number of barrels of oil, ounces of gold, ounces of copper, 
etc. And if you've been following the work of Zoltan Pozar, Pozar who gets a lot of a lot of publicity, he's an analyst over at Credit Suisse and a, a very smart, very smart guy. He's talked about the rise of commodity-backed monies like this, and and he has cited that the, the uh, paring down of U.S. Treasury holdings by Russia and various Asian countries as being part of this move. But I would argue that money backed by a basket of commodities, it just creates the same problems that we had on the gold standard. The problem is who gets to hold and verify that the commodities are really there. You also have the problem with commodities like wheat. They don't last forever. They can get infected by insects. They can get eaten by insects, etc. So that might not be the best thing. Crude oil can light on fire if you're not storing it properly. Gold can be lost, or you can have a situation where you say the gold is in the vault and it's not really in the vault. So if you if you move to money backed by a basket of commodities, you end up in the same with the same problems that you had under the U.S. gold standard. How do you send these commodities around the world if someone wants to take delivery and convert their currency units into the commodities? It's really a pain to do that, and this leads you right back into a trust-based system like we had with the U.S. gold standard. In the global gold standard, we can see how miserably the gold standard has failed and how it failed in the 1960s. For example, France and Germany wanted to repatriate some of their gold, especially France wanted to. And this is why Nixon had to uh, remove the U.S. from the gold standard. So this is one reason I believe that especially in the 21st century, in a digital age, this is another reason I believe that we're headed not to a commodity, a physical commodity-backed currency as a new global currency or global reserve standard, but we're headed to a digital commodity standard. And that the only candidate for that, the only real digital commodity that can handle this is Bitcoin. It has the global brand. People will say that you could use Dogecoin or Litecoin, but they just can't compete in terms of brand or in terms of hash rate security or in terms of many other things like that. So that's why I believe rather than we're being headed toward a global commodity-backed new currency that we're headed to a global Bitcoin standard, as I've been arguing on this channel for many years now. The nice thing about Bitcoin, you don't have to store it in giant vaults and you don't have to send it around the world on, world on ships. You can also just sign a transaction to prove that you own a certain amount of it and you don't need to you don't need to verify it or assay it in the same way that you need to do with gold, which is, becomes very expensive. And you end up relying on trust as well. It's much better to have a cryptographic proof as you can have with Bitcoin. We've already seen uh, inklings of this last uh, early last year. There is this article that ran on the BBC saying Russia was considering accepting Bitcoin for oil and gas. So I think this is where the world is set is is heading. We're going to continue to see both allies and enemies sell down their U.S. Treasury holdings, and it's it's ultimately gonna, it's ultimately going to be up to the Fed to buy these treasuries from them to stabilize interest rates in the U.S. Otherwise, the Fed is just going to watch the U.S. housing market and the, and the U.S. stock market continue to go down the toilet. If you found this video helpful, be sure to hit that subscribe and like button. Hit the notification bell if you want to be notified when I publish my next video. And let me know your questions and comments in the comment section below. Thanks all for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.